Go ahead. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us today. We will talk about security and how to protect your company info. And in about 30 minutes, you'll be able to increase the security of your company many times over. Uh, the presenter most of you already know and have met is the owner at PCSN, Nadim Azar. Mr. Azar has been working in IT security for over 20 years and has worked with many agencies over the years. I'll no, now, now turn over the mic to Nadim. Thank you, uh, Mac, uh, uh, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, my name is Nadim Azar. I've been doing this uh, since 97. Uh, I've uh, worked uh, with several different agencies uh, over the years uh, regarding security. Uh, so uh, that's uh, I, I have some insight into how the, the hackers and the bad guys work. Uh, so we're going to jump right into it. Um, uh, today we, we have limited time, so we'll just uh, keep going and we'll keep all the questions uh, till the end. So today we're going to cover what is cybercrime in non-techie terms. Um, it not only uh, damages your reputations, but uh, we've seen that in small business, um, most companies that go through a disaster like this, did they do not recover. So it's pretty much a do or die situation for a lot of small companies, small businesses. Uh, we're gonna go over why you can be the target, why you are the target and you can be the next victim uh, and why the bad guys do what they do. And then finally, we're going to show you how to protect yourself. And ultimately, it's about the bottom line. Uh, we're going to show you how to be smart, strategic, and intentional with your IT decisions. Um, we don't want to kind of haphazardly go through uh, trying to do this and do that and not really know. We want to do the tried and true things uh, as far as security is concerned. So that, that's going to be the, uh, the goal of this uh, webinar. Uh, and if you hang out till the end, uh, we're going to do an assessment and uh, we will kind of go through the domain and see uh, if there are any compromises and how the, your domain security is from a public perspective. So this is going to be information that is available to the public. There is no uh, confidential information that we're going to share in this webinar. Uh, so you're probably asking who the heck is Nadim and uh, uh, I've been doing this for 20 years and uh, uh, my focus is a small to medium sized business. Uh, that's what we focus on. Uh, there's plenty of uh, resources available for large enterprise, but it's 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 kind of rare in the small business space to to ha find somebody who who focuses on security within the small to medium sized uh, business budget. Um, I have come up with a strategy that is designed for 20 to 50 user businesses. So uh, uh, well, we do have that and. Uh, um, so I've been, uh, uh, I have a strategy for 20 to 50 user business uh, without requiring the large enterprise bu budget. Uh, PCSN is uniquely positioned to focus on security since uh, we have a wide variety of expertise around cloud, app dev, and even enterprise voice industries. So we kind of have this uh, big picture view uh, with our specialists in, in these different fields and we kind of bring it all together and kind of glue all that together. So uh, we, we, we are uh, very strategic about this and uh, we can um, uh, we can really help small to medium sized business uh, get their security uh, better and a lot of times better than how it is in enterprise. Uh, and we'll talk about this later on. Uh, so why is this important? Um, you can see some of the numbers uh, up here on the screen. Now, these are older numbers from 2012, uh, but these are concrete numbers. They're accurate numbers. Uh, 289,000 number of reported incidents in 2012. And then you can see the amount of funds that was involved. Now, keep in mind, small businesses, medium businesses, they are under no obligation to report uh, incidents. So these numbers are very conservative. Uh, and uh, that was in 2012, so now you can imagine how this number has kind of skyrocketed, right? Uh, so uh, stolen funds, uh, they're not reported by small business, but we do see that a lot of times when a small business has an incident, and I believe the number is somewhere around 49% of the time uh, during a disaster, these companies, they uh, 
do not survive. So it's it's pretty much a do or die situation for small business. A uh, little history, why is this a problem all of a sudden? Why this wasn't a problem 10, 12, 13 years ago? Why is it a problem all of a sudden? Because of the number of devices that we have that we have connected to the internet. So so that's the problem. Um, uh, it, it's a double-edged sword. You know, you, you want to have all these devices connected, uh, you know, to, to maximize user productivity, uh, but then being connected kind of opens the door for uh, the bad guys to, to get access. Uh, here's a little bit of uh, overview of the threat landscape for small business. Now, this is specifically for small business, and you can see the number is 43% of cyber attacks that target small business. Now, uh, these are actual numbers, 43% uh, of small businesses. That's, that's a large number, so 43% are uh, uh, attacked, and uh, out of that 43%, uh, a joining. lot of a lot of these uh, companies will eventually uh, go out of business uh, depending on the level of attack. And out of these uh, 43 businesses, 55 devices are compromised. Uh, a lot of times businesses don't even know that some of their devices are compromised. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, so 60 percent of small business will close their doors after a cyber attack. Now, we're not talking about. Uh, you know, one machine getting hacked here, one machine getting hacked there. The the, the attacks are getting sophisticated. They're getting more targeted. Uh, if you get one computer infected, the goal for the bad guys is going to be to use that one infected computer to infect everything across your network. So it's critical going forward, especially in, in this day and age, when you have multiple devices connected to the Internet that we protect. We have a holistic approach to security when it comes to your IT infrastructure. So the average uh, cyber attack remediation cost for small business is $900,000. That's the average. Uh, so that's a huge number. And that's why a lot of the small businesses, they close their doors after a cyber attack. Uh, and we're going to talk about uh, several different uh, customers we've helped. Uh, Jason Epps is uh, president of QuickSurf. Uh, they build uh, these uh, uh, quick delivery service windows. Uh, they're at banks, Walgreens, uh, uh, drive throughs uh, They make these uh, uh, quick serve windows. Uh, in a recent audit uh, that was done uh, at QuickServe, the uh, the auditors were impressed by the level of security at this company. Now, this this company was going through a merger slash acquis uh, acquisition phase, and that's why uh, third party auditors were were brought in. And Jason called me one day and he says, hey, Nadim, I was kind of dreading this, that they were going to do an audit and our security was not going to be on par because we are a small business. The auditors were blown away that the level of security this company has. Now, uh, from 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 a from a big perspective, you know, it's just a, a, a you know service window manufacturer, but it is a very. Uh, a competitive market to be in. <laughs> uh, you wouldn't think so, but uh, but yes, it is. So we have uh, propelled QuickServe uh, to a point where um, they don't have to worry about issues like viruses, hackers. Um, it, you know, user comes in, they get to work, it just works. And, and that's our goal is to make it easy for users so that it just works. Um, now, Talking about this, one you know, one of the things that the question comes up, and and I usually ask uh, attendees, uh, you know, when we're in a one to you know in a seminar, it's easy to ask and get a poll, but but I'll just ask this: uh, How many people here think that they use some sort of cloud technology? Now, normally when I say this, about half of the room raises their hand. Uh, everybody should raise their hand. You may not know it, but pretty much every business out there is using some sort of cloud technology. Even if you are not aware, you are using it, and and I can guarantee you that. Um, uh, there, it, it's 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 just a given. Uh, as time goes on, we're going to see more and more uh, uh, businesses that are doing this. So, so some of the things that I hear uh, from owners, business owners, and decision makers, why they think they're safe and protected. They don't they don't need to do anything. They don't need to worry about hackers because the hacker doesn't want anything on my PC. Now, 
of course, it, this is a little different for business, but this could also apply to your home PC. You know, you might be thinking, well, uh, the only thing I do is I connect to my office from my home PC. I have nothing saved on my home PC. Why would anybody want my home PC? So even if you don't have any sensitive information on your home PC, the bad guys want to recruit your PC to be a part of their bot network. So what they want to do is use your PC to attack other PCs. Simple as that. If if your PC is connected to the internet, you are the bad guys are already looking at how they can get into your PC. So this rationale does not work that there's nothing on my PC or I just use it for checking email or my company's not big enough, uh, you know, for the hackers to, you know, we don't work for the CIA or we don't do any work for any three letter agencies. There's nothing confidential or important, you know, like that on my PC. Um, if, if that's the mindset you're going in with, then uh, you are mistaken. Uh, every company out there has information that someone else out there is looking for. And even if you do not, if it's a personal machine, let's say it's just for your kids to use, the bad guys still want in on that PC so they can uh, recruit it for their bot network. And just a quick overview of how valuable one PC is. Now, this is a PC that is not even on your company network. This is an individual PC, maybe your PC at home that maybe you know kids use or somebody uses uh, every now and then. Look at how many uh, avenues of, of information this PC has that the bad guys want. So you can use it for bot activity, account credentials, financial credentials, hostage attacks. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff that's going on. And uh, and we're going to cover all of this. We're going to go over how you can make your PC, even your PC at the house, safer, uh, and especially how you can uh, safeguard your enterprise network. So the question comes, well, you know, OK, we know the bad guys are doing this, but why are they doing this? What's in it for them? Well, this is what's in it for them. So these are some real world examples here. Uh, look at this, uh, Citibank. Uh, now, this is this was uh, for sale. Um, a balance of uh, fifteen to forty-seven thousand is guaranteed in this bank account, and they're selling this information for five percent. So this is actually available on the black market, uh, what we call the dark web, uh, for sale. So uh, if you have forty thousand U.S. dollars in a bank account, they're going to sell it for five percent balance. It's a lucrative business to be in, uh, right? And it's uh, and that's why the bad guys do it. A lot of times you'll 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 hear a story from somebody who says, "Oh yeah, I got a call. You know, it was you know somebody claiming to be the, from the sheriff. They have warrants for my arrest because blah blah blah. You know, uh, because of some IRS audit that you know. Uh, how can somebody fall for that? Well, you didn't fall for it, but people still fall for it, and that's why bad guys keep doing it because it's very lucrative business for them to be in. Another example of how the bad guys get paid. Uh, look at this. For $10, you can buy a, an account that has $147 in it. That's the U.S. balance, right? And that is verified. Uh, you can go down uh, non-verified, $349, and for $10. So all of these are available for $10. Now, this is actual data uh, available on the dark web uh, when, we, when we pulled this uh, presentation together. Uh, this was actual data at that time. Uh, the numbers we are seeing that these numbers over here, the balances, these are going up and uh, the bad guys are doing a lot more volume than what they were uh, only a few years ago. Uh, here's another example, American Express uh, for sale, American Express or Discover. So this is uh, $25 each. Now, uh, the there could be you know you can charge up to you know a few hundred dollars or a few thousand dollars on mx and you can buy it for 25 dollars so very very lucrative business uh, to be in uh, for both the buyers and the sellers right so the question becomes how do you wrap your head around the overall security of your business right uh, when we talk about security people think ransomware People think emails getting hacked. People think email credentials getting hacked, right? That's just a small part of the pie. One of the things that is overlooked uh, very easily, and I, and I see this all the time in small to medium business, is 
the third party sites that your users have to go to in the course of their business. Uh, some of you might have LinkedIn accounts. I know some of you have LinkedIn accounts and you use it for business. Uh, Facebook, uh, more and more businesses are getting involved in Facebook. Uh, I mean, in the marketplace and things like that, there's there's more and more stuff going on over there. Uh, Twitter, some of you might be using it, some of you might not. Uh, now, I know internally we use uh, Facebook, we use LinkedIn, we use Twitter. Uh, we don't use uh, you know Instagram or anything like that, but that opens up the uh, opens you up to the bad guy. So, uh, for example, you might use Dropbox, you might use Box. Now, what happens in this situation is if your LinkedIn credentials, let's say, for example, your LinkedIn credential gets hacked, that's associated with your company email address, right? Now, the bad guys know that the password that you're using is going to be something similar to that what you're using for your LinkedIn account. So they are already so much closer to getting access to your account. Now, of course, there are things that you can put in place that protect your core services like your uh, email identities that protect that so you can enable multi-factor authentication. However, be cautious. Don't let your guard down that you've enabled MFA and multi-factor authentication and that you should be protected. There has been a proof of concept attack already launched and proven that it works. MFA, people can get around that. <laughs> so, so don't just in, in, in implement MFA and call it a day. You have to be proactive about security, right? So, uh, can can uh, can anybody guess uh, how many cyber attacks happen in a day? Um, it, so, uh, you know, normally uh, I you know I ask this in a seminar, and and you know we're all over the board. So I'm going to give you the answer. Approximately every day, about a million cyber attacks are attempted. A million every day. Majority of their targets are small to medium business. So what you see in the news, the large enterprise that gets hacked, the LinkedIn's of the world or the Facebook's of the world that get hacked, that's just a small portion. Majority of the attacks are happening against small businesses that we don't even hear about because there is no uh, requirement for these businesses to uh, divulge that data to, to announce that, that they've been compromised. So, uh, you know, another uh, thing I hear from small business owners and small businesses is that, uh, oh, we are too small to be attacked. Uh, so look at some of the numbers here. No business is safe. It doesn't matter if you're a five user business or if you're a 500 user business. Uh, data is data at the end of the day, and that's what bad guys are after. So um, one million attacks per day and 80,000 plus compromised emails daily. Uh, now, you can control some of this by implementing MFA, but keep in mind, uh, MFA is not going to do it all for you. Uh, there is already a proof of concept to get around MFA, um, and all it takes is one bad guy at your cell provider, and there goes your MFA, right? That pin goes over your cellular network. The average number of breach records, 28,000 right huge number uh, and you can you can read on the screen hopefully everybody can read that some of the numbers here I'm not going to go through all of those uh, but what we are going to touch on is a helpful tip so what do you do if you realize that a machine or a couple of machines on your network have been compromised right if you have strategized about your security you should not get to this point but if you are at this point what do you need to do? First of all, disconnect the machine from the network and then get professional help. I have seen it several times where, and I'll give you a real world example at a law firm, uh, one of the one of the uh, uh, office workers, her machine got hacked. This was Friday. So her machine got compromised and she started Googling from the same machine, mind you, she started Googling to figure out how to clean it up. She didn't want to say anything. She was a she was a new hire, so she didn't want to say anything. Uh, she was browsing the web, and, and that's how it got hacked or, or compromised. So Friday night, 
She leaves. Her machine is still infected. She tried to Google, try to figure out how to clean up stuff, and and she couldn't figure it out. So she was like, "Okay, it's getting late. I'm going to leave. I'll figure it out Monday." Well, this was a ransomware attack. So come Monday, uh, the server was compromised by this time because she left her machine compromised. It was still connected to the network, and it had the whole weekend to encrypt as many files as it could on their servers. Now, had this company not had a good, reliable backup system, they would have been out of business. I mean, we're talking a law firm. We're talking a law firm that has to be in court, a law firm that has court deadlines. They can't go to the judge and say, oh, judge, we got ransomware attack. Uh, you know, sorry, we can't do anything. That doesn't work. So, of course, come Monday morning, everybody's scrambling. Um, uh, what do we do? How do we get to this data? Hey, I need to be in court. I need this. I need that file that, that you were working on on Friday. Well, you know, too bad. So sad, right? Uh, so along with security, one of the main things that you want to do is make sure that you have good backups. So disconnect your machine, uh, get a professional help. Don't try to Google for a fix. That is not going to work. It's only going to make matters worse. So in this uh, example that I gave you about the law firm, the lady was trying to solve after Googling. She was trying to fix that, that ransomware attack issue that she had. And what did she end up doing? She ended up removing the key, the decryption key that was going to be used to decrypt if you paid the ransom. That's how the ransomware works, right? So they, they put a key on your computer. Once you pay the ransom, they give you a key to uh, unlock unlock the it matches up to the key on your computer and it unlocks the data and decrypts it for you it's all automated there, there's no human involvement uh, at that point um, and and you know so that's how it works but what happened in this case is the lady tried to fix it herself so she removed the key on that was on her machine the one piece of information that was on that machine that could have been used to decrypt the data she removed because she was trying to use Google to fix her problem uh, and and don't try that unless you've been doing this for a living. You've been doing this for a while. The bad guys are always going to have. They're going to be one step ahead of you. So so your process of attempting to resolve it is only going to make matters worse. And I've seen it several times, uh, specifically at this law firm. And and this law firm is still in business. They just couldn't afford to to pay for the cleanup after the fact because the damage was so far done. And, and when we were brought in, uh, we found out that they they had backups. The backups were good backups, but they were not historical backups. So they only can go back one day in time. And since this attack happened on a Friday, come Monday morning, it was already too late because even the backup was corrupted at this point. So uh, just a word of caution there. Why are attacks so successful? <clears throat> so it only takes a hacker about four minutes to get to your network, right? But it takes a business 99 or more days to discover that they've been breached and start doing something about that. Ransomware is, is an anomaly, right? Ransomware, it's easy to detect. Easy to detect. As soon as your files get encrypted, you cannot access your files, boom. That there's a red flag right there. But some of the other attacks are not as evident. They will, the, the, the attack will happen, the, the, the bot or the bad guys will stay on your machine silent for several days or months even. And then one day they will activate it and then they'll start either making attacks to other machines from your machine or using the data off of your machine. Now, one of the things that that you may have uh, encountered recently is a much more focused attack, which we are seeing, and we'll talk a little bit about it as we go on. So 30% of users open emails from attackers, right? 10% of them click on links. A question would be, do you know how many compromised emails your users open? So are your users aware of how to tell an email is bad. Now, keep in mind, the bad emails are going to come from somebody they know. 
So the bad guys got around that, you know, sending email from from a strange account. They're not going to do that. Your users are going to get an email from somebody they already know. So the the temptation is to go ahead and click on that email and open it. And then the second temptation is to click on that link on that email. Just a funny fact. Majority of people who click on links, those links were about a funny joke. I kid you not. It was about a funny joke. In the body of the email, it says, oh, look at this very funny. And then there's a link there. So since it came from somebody, you know, you're like, oh, yeah, you know, John always sends me funny jokes and you click on that link and boom, the damage is done. 63% of attacks are because of weak passwords, either default stolen or weak passwords. Now that 63%, how that works is normally there are two parties involved in an attack. There is a, a party that uh, compromises your credentials and then the first party sells these credentials on one of the marketplaces to a second party that then launches the attack. So this is what what we've seen traditionally happen. Two parties involved or two or more. Uh, one party gets their credentials. Second party launches the attack against those credentials. Now we're seeing a third type of attack recently, which is a much more focused attack, which you may have encountered already. It is prevalent in the small business space, which is the bad guys want to uh, the bad guys want to uh, it's just one party and the one party is focused on getting the credentials to an entity on your network and then the same one party is the one launching the attack to get information and the way this works is the bad guy and, and usually it's a company uh, and I'm putting that in quotes you can't see but so th this this entity is going to uh, attack focus on your users attack those users get their credentials silently go through their mailbox identify prospects that can be beneficial to them usually these prospects are people who owe you money and then since they go through this email and they had already focused on somebody in your either accounting or accounts receivable or whatever have you, now the bad guys have invoice information. They know what your uh, invoices look like. They uh, know who owes you money. Now it's very easy for them to create an invoice and send to your pr prospects who owe you money or just e send an email from that compromised account at your domain that was somebody in finance, somebody in accounting that they compromised. So when an email comes out from this account, it goes to one of your partners who owe you money. And you, the email says, oh, we just uh, changed our bank accounts and this is a new uh, bank information. Please submit the payment for invoice so-and-so to this bank account. And I kid you not, most, most vendors, partners who owe you money are sending money based on that email. Now, in larger enterprise, there is a policy, and the policy is any change of account information, you are required to use an alternate method of contact to confirm. So if the request came in via email, you are required to either get confirmation via fax or via phone call. If that email, uh, if that uh, uh, request came in via phone call, then you are required to use either fax or email or snail mail. So basically you use an alternate method for confirmation because if you if you get an email and you're replying back via email, that email is not going to make it to the actual user. The bad guys are in between there. So the bad guys are going to get that email and they're going to respond back. Oh yes, it's true. It's urgent. Please do so now. Uh, and we've seen that happen. We've seen uh, during an analysis of, of one of these uh, breaches, it was interesting to see that there was actually a human that was going through the mailbox and responding to people and and taking care of this hack and 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 the one company that got hacked they got had for about sixty one thousand dollars and uh, yeah it's uh, it happened uh, now on the other side of the equation you know the the banks they are not required to to get your money back uh, most of the time they can just because you're a good customer but they're not required to and insurance does not cover cybercrime so the the fdic does not cover cybercrime so 
push comes to shove, the bank can say, hey, what's done is done. We can't do anything, right? Uh, so when, when something like this happens and you need to approach your bank, don't be forceful about it. Make a request, not a demand. Um, and uh, in the, you know, what I've seen so far, uh, you know, uh, some of the some of the companies that have gotten uh, uh, involved in these kind of attacks, they have got their money back from the bank just because, you know, the banks want to want to accommodate. They, you know, the banks want to keep you happy, but they could say no if they wanted to. And 58 percent of users act accidentally share information. Uh, that's a big one, too. So training is important in these kind of situations. You want to do several different things. You want to train your users to identify what is an attack. What does an attack look like, right? And once you train them, you want to check if that training took hold in, in that user's mind, right? So you want to then test them somehow. And then once you do that, then you want to go back to, uh, to in the circle, you want to go back to the training part. So. If you identify certain users are weak, uh, let's say, in identifying links in an email or they end up clicking links in an email, well, we want to put those users back into training. Now, all this data that you're doing, all this data that you're collecting, you want to be able to report it in an easy to read way because, you know, with with IT and, and, and you know, uh, managers in any department, you can't throw a lot of this information, a lot of this raw data at them and expect them to make heads or tails of it. So you need to be able to present this in an easy to understand way uh, so that they see the benefit of, of training or, or test or whatever you're doing, right? So one of the things that you wanna do that is crucial, step one, we always talk about is monitoring. So are do you have some sort of an alert system in place when a user's credentials go up for sale? Are you alerted? Does your IT team know user so-and-so's credentials are compromised? And it doesn't matter if MFA is enabled on that user or not, because it's only a matter of time. MFA, uh, you know, the, with the proof of concept that just happened a few months ago, uh, it's only a matter of time that people are going to get around uh, the MFA thing. Uh, a lot of times what we see is that these credentials, they get uh, leaked from third parties like LinkedIn or or let's say Marriott. Now, uh, uh, my fitness pal. Yeah, that's uh, that's what I was thinking of. So so we had another uh, now this is a public company. Uh, it's an insurance company. Uh, so so being a public company, they are required to report uh, breaches, right? So this company uh, had their, their their employee health program, which was uh, tied to my fitness pal. So they gave everybody uh, membership to my fitness pal uh, for their employees to 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 you know keep up their health. Well, since my fitness pal was now associated with the company in some way in their employees' heads, the employees were using same or similar credentials that they use for their company email, right? It just makes sense because, oh, well, the company's sponsoring that, so you know, I'm going to use the same credential, right? So when my fitness pal got hacked, and 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 it's real, yes, they did get hacked. When they got hacked, a lot of the credentials that were used on my fitness pal were the same credentials these people were using for their company email. Now, the my fitness pal uses the email address as a username, so as soon as that got breached, the bad guys had their the people's usernames, people's passwords. If MFA was not enabled for these users, piece of cake, they're they're going in, they're in, you know, the damage is done. If MFA was enabled, now the bad guys have to do one more step. They either need to get around that MFA using this proof of concept, or they maybe they don't know that MFA is enabled, and when they try to log in, the user gets that pin code on their handheld in the middle of the night and if it's a savvy user they'll be like oh i know what happened somebody's trying to log in i'm going to change my password right now that would be the right thing to do only if the user was trained to do it a lot of times user will be like they'll get this pin code in the middle of the night and then by morning they'll go to their it guys and say oh hey you know my, something's messed up because i'm getting these pin codes in the middle of the night and of course, the IT guys are going to roll their eyes and say, oh, you know, uh, but uh, training is a crucial part. The first step is 
you you need to be monitoring what's happening, what's going on as far as these breaches. Soon as somebody's credentials go up for sale, uh, you want to be able to capture that and report on that. These are some of the recent uh, breaches. So um, uh, I don't know if my fitness pal is on here or not. Maybe that's too recent. Uh, yeah, it's not on there. But anyway, so you can see, you know, some of these uh, some of these companies are. Um, I mean, we use them every day, right? I mean, oh, my fitness pal is there. Look, 150 million. Wow. Okay. Uh, Marriott. Oh, that was a big number. Uh, but you you get the idea what happens here. So. Uh, what we want to do is, and, and normally we will do this, uh, now you can send your information to Mac, and what Mac will do is he can pull your domain and see if anything on your domain is available right now. But I'm going to go a step further on this, and what we're going to do is there are a few users here, so we're going to take a test company, and I'm going to show you how uh, a breach has happened and if a certain domain is compromised. So I'm going to use, let me log into my system real quick and I'll move it over to the other screen so you can see. Uh, what we're going to do is, I think I have a test company that we will use. So here we go. Let me just log in, do my second factor authentication here and as soon as we're in, I'll move it over to the other screen. Here we go. And uh, so uh, actually, let me move it over. There is uh, too much here. I don't want to show all that. Let me let me drill down to. OK, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a live search right now, right? So I'm not going to show you one of the existing accounts that we're monitoring, but I'm going to do a live search. So. Uh, uh, let's do a live search on something a little generic. OK, so let's say. At. How about gmail.com, right? Everybody knows what Gmail is. Let's see. Uh, ah, public domain is not going to let me do that. OK, so we're going to do. Let's do. This is a test domain grandma's garden. Dot biz. All right. So let's do a test on that. So private domain, boom, looky here. So you see what happened here. My fitness pal breach in 2018 was that credential was sold on a dark website. So these credentials got sold twice. Interesting. So on 621, they got sold on a dark web website. Somebody bought these credentials and then it was for sale again on ID theft forum. So now a lot of times these credentials, they may get sold multiple times, right? And, and, and for some of you who can see the screen, you can see how the same, you know, the user Katie, uh, her credentials got sold twice. Now, if you were on this system and you were the IT admin with access to this portal, you'll be able to see the full password. Uh, when we do this quick search, we hide, we try to hide or obfuscate the, the password. We don't show all of it, you know. But if you were the IT admin and you had access to this portal, you'll be able to see the full password of that user and be able to verify if that's an actual uh, uh, user, uh, actual. Uh, credential for that user or not, and if those are the same credentials the user is using in uh, on other sites as opposed to MyFitnessPal. So let's uh, let's look at this right here. Okay. So <laughs> this is. I'm not going to say who this is. You can probably find out, but. A lot of compromises here, right? 2019. And that's one of the partners. Uh, leaked from social media. Now this is pretty important. You see that? So this little guy tells me what other information is available for sale for that user. Address, zip, phone. So now. Schwarzberg has his address city zip phone first name last name in the public domain he probably doesn't know it but i might need to call him on that 
Uh, th this is not a customer, by the way. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, just a company I've I've worked with. Um, yeah. So, but you get the idea. So there is a lot of information that goes on sale, and and the Pi two hit, uh, the the Pi hit we call it, is the P two hit is uh, additional information that might be available for sale, right? So in in this case, this is interesting to me because this this is not a good thing to have you know uh, not only now do you know the email the passwords uh, their social media info but now you also have their physical uh, info um, in the hand of bad guys so so essentially what this means is that if you were savvy enough a uh, savvy enough bad guy you could actually launch an attack via phone because you have a phone number here or you can do via phone and via mail so if you get a phone call and says and, and, and it says you know oh hey I'm I'm calling from the IRS you're gonna you know uh, 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 you're gonna get a, something in the mail from me uh, you know two days from now or whatever and then two days from now that mail actually arrives whoa you know that just legitimizes it right I mean in in pretty much every layman's mind out there is going to be like whoa you know this is real uh, when it's really not so all that information got released through a social media breach. Uh, that's what this tells us. So uh, now uh, I'm going to go. I'm going to move this off, and I'm going to go back to our test domain, and I'm going to show you what kind of alerts that we get when we when when you're monitoring somebody, right? So uh, let's go down here. Let's see. We're going to do Grandma's Garden. So this is uh, this is just a report on. Um, what simulations have been done, what training has been done. But what I'm interested in is the compromise, right? So that's the the, the same KD compromise that we had that we did the instant search on. Uh, and this is showing us more information. So look at that, the full password. Now this is just a test domain, so it really doesn't matter. But the breach happened from MyFitnessPal. So now if if that account is tied to this domain and the use and this is a company sponsored deal, then this password is probably the same password that user uses for her email as well. Uh, so that's how these attacks work. Um, you know, it's uh, everything links to everything else, right? So, so that's how that's how this attack happens. So let me close out of that. Let me close out of that. So. Uh, the next step is going to be uh, get with Mac, email Mac at PCSN.net, and we can, uh, Mac can arrange for an assessment so we can run a quick scan on your domain and then uh, figure out from there how, uh, if there are any compromises and what to do about these compromises. Now, of course, if you are in this, uh, in this uh, webinar and if you are a PCSN customer, then you probably already have MFA enabled, uh, which makes it only harder for the bad guys to get to you, but it does not prevent them to get to you. So even if you have MFA enabled, be sure to implement monitoring at the minimum, and then um, uh, it's even better and recommended if you, along with monitoring, you have training for users, and then you have phishing simulations for users so first you train the users and once they're trained then you simulate an attack against them and see how they fare uh, right now we're not talking about just uh, random attacks we're talking about attacks that are that we foresee as coming out in the near future so basically what we want to do is prepare the user for the attack that's going to happen ahead of time and uh, that's all uh, all I have. Now, normally we would do a Q&A, and I think uh, we can if, if anybody has any questions. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording, and then uh, we will uh, open up a uh, mic for everybody, and, and we can do a Q&A &A real quick uh, if, uh, if you guys want to do that. So let me stop the recording here.